gather again. It is strange to me when you have worship prior to Bible class because everywhere I go, it's always the opposite of that. And so it throws me off a little bit, but uh, I'm glad to get to talk to you for the Bible class hour, and I'm glad we've got the teens in here as well. Before I actually get started today, uh, I want to share with you some information about the table that's in the back. If you go, I guess that's technically the front, but if you go out this door and turn to the left, there is a table that is set up there for the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Uh, there are a number of things on that table. First, there is a sign-up list, and on that sign-up list, if you will write your email address, then uh, we will send you updates about the programs we're doing at the Gospel Broadcasting Network, the links where you can download those. <clears throat> if you would like to have it, we also have a daily devotional that we e email out every single morning. You can check or write that you'd like the daily devotional. We promise not to spam you. We never share your email address with anybody else, but uh, you can sign up for that. If you're interested in how to support GBN, let me know. A lot of our support comes from people that support us $25 a month. We don't sell anything at GBN. We exist by the free will offerings of members of the Church of Christ and congregations of the Lord's people. And so uh, I'm not ashamed to ask because that's the only way we do the Lord's work. So if you would like to find out about that, uh, let me know. If you don't know what GBN is, there's a couple of flyers that we have in the back. Uh, this one says, what is GBN? And it has a wagon wheel here, and it tells about the various works that we have. We're on Direct TV. We're on Dish Network. We have 14 cable stations, or, or 25 cable stations that carry us, 14 radio stations that play us 24-7. Not just a few programs, but it is nothing but GBN. We are actually having a lot of our uh, conversions these days coming through social media. And so if you're on Instagram, you can follow us. We are under the name The Authentic Christian, and we are having baptisms every single month from our Instagram presence. And if I had time, I'd tell you some more about that. Uh, all of the DVDs on the back table are free. I hope that you will pick those up and make use of them. We have one called The Proof of the Existence of God. This is from Apologetics Press. We've got one that I have done called The Kingdom and the end of time, and it deals with some things like the book of Revelation, premillennialism, things that are going on in the denominational world. This is one of the most recent ones I've done. It's called the Apocrypha and the Lost Books of the Bible. You regularly hear people say that we're missing books of the Bible. Is that true? How do you explain that? We've got one dealing with women's role in the church. We've got a lot of people that are pushing for that. We're even going to say something about that in the sermon today. Christian growth. What is the responsibility of a Christian after he becomes a Christian? What must I do to be saved? A lot of people use this as an evangelistic tool, and they keep them with them and give them to people. Evil pain and suffering. This deals with some of the things I talked about this morning that atheists say and accuse the church about. The Truth About Moral Issues has eight lessons on it. It deals with some things like lying, gambling, pornography, modesty, drinking, dancing. Uh, God's Plan for Saving Man. This is a breakdown, a detailed study. Uh, one lesson just on faith, one just on repentance, and there are several on baptism. One that just answers the objections that denominational people make about baptism. Where do we go when we die? We're actually going to cover this lesson tomorrow night, but uh, this is a great evangelistic tool because it gets people thinking about what happens after death. Uh, this one, The Truth About Worship, is designed for new Christians. Now that I'm a Christian, it deals with staying saved. Bible study, attendance, prayer, each of the acts of worship are dealt with in there. There's one dealing with the Ten Commandments. If you talk to denominational people, you're going to hear this. We, we live under the Ten Commandments today is what they're going to say. Why are there so many churches in the world today? We're going to study that this week also. But this is a good evangelistic tool to break the ice in talking to people. And uh, there's another Ten Commandments, but those are back there. Uh, please make use of those. All right, we have till what time for class? Ten fifteen. I'm in trouble. It's ten twenty three already. Okay. All right. Sounds good. You may be aware of the fact that uh, the Methodist Church has been having big troubles over the issue of homosexuality. The United Methodist Church recently had a vote on this particular issue 
and their vote was to see what their stance was going to be. Now, that's interesting to me because the Bible should determine that, not the vote of the Methodist Church, but they were trying to decide, are we going to keep opposing it or are we going to stand or are we going to accept it? And what about gay clergy? What are we going to do with that? Pew Research ran an article in February of this year and it discusses the fact that since a lot of United Methodists are accepting homosexuality, it forced this vote. Well, I was kind of surprised, but after they had the vote, they decided we're going to continue to oppose it. They're expecting now that the Methodist Church is going to, to split in half and form two different denominations, the pro-gay Methodist Church and then the anti-gay Methodist Church. Very interesting. The article goes on to say that the legalization of homosexuality in this country by the Supreme Court in 2015, they think is what is causing so many to accept it these days. The article goes on to say that, mo that, that there's only a few, quote, major mainline Protestant denominations in the United States that currently do not sanction same-sex marriage. It says the Episcopal Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the Presbyterian Church, and others have recently embraced gay marriage in recent years. What does that tell us? Just plant that thought. Listen to this next one. There's an article dated um, March of this year, March 30th, on Breitbart.com. The title of the article is Philadelphia Archbishop, this is the Catholic Church, Philadelphia Archbishop says that predatory homosexuality is the cause of the sexual crisis in the Catholic Church. If you've been following news, you know that the Catholic Church has had a lot of scandals in recent years about children being molested. This Archbishop is saying the reason is homosexuality. And he's upset with the Pope because he won't acknowledge that. I'll tell you some more about that in a minute. Here's another article. Religionnews.com. I ran across this article. It was just a few months ago. It said, Notable Christians who have had a change of heart on the LGBT issue. That is, these are denominational preachers and what they call notable Christians who say that they have run across, quote, some new things that have caused them to reevaluate this issue, and they have now changed their stance. I don't know what new things they're looking at because the Bible hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Even more recent, March of this year, San Antonio, Texas, their city council has voted to remove Chick fil A from the airport in San Antonio. Now, why would they remove Chick fil A? Everybody loves Chick fil A, right? I got a lot of gift cards to Chick fil A. Why did they remove them? Well, you know why. It's because Chick-fil-A opposes the LGBTQ movement, and they said because of that, we want them out. I could go on and on. I've got a lot of this material, but the point that I'm making is we are bombarded by this issue on a daily basis. Brethren, young people are being brainwashed about this. Older people are being bullied. They are being abused. They are being boycotted if they don't accept homosexuality. Now, is it working? Pew Research said that in 2001, support for gay marriage was 35% in this country. That's 2001, 35%. In 2017, it was 62%. I bet two years later in 2019, if I had the figures, I bet it's higher than that. Pew Research says if you break it down by political party, Democrats support it at 73%. Independents support it at 70%. Republicans support it at 40%. Has the Lord's church been affected? That's the next question. Brethren, we would be fooling ourselves if we believe that the Lord's church has been unaffected by this. When my daughter Macy was a student at Freed Hardeman University in 2015, she's graduated now, but when this, the Supreme Court passed this um, law in June of 2015, she was still a student there. And I was talking to her on the phone one day, and she said to me, Dad, there is tremendous support amongst students on the campus of Freed Hardman University for this. And I said, Macy, I have a hard time believing that. I said, Freed Hardeman's one of the most conservative schools that we have. She said, Dad, I'm here. I'm telling you there are students that support this. I later talked to Brother Dan Winkler, who was a teacher there at the time, and I asked Brother Dan about this. And Brother Dan said, oh, yes, yes, there is support amongst students 
for gay marriage. And I got to thinking about this. What is the age of students at Freed Hardeman? 18 to 22? What's been going on in this country for the last 25 years? If you have grown up in the last 25 years, you have had this shoved down your throat. You have been bombarded with this. It's on television. If you don't believe it, you are told that you're a hater, you are a bigot. I can see why people would believe this if that's what you have been brainwashed to believe your entire life. Here's an article that begins this way. The article is from 2018, October of 2018. Lipscomb University ran this in their school newspaper. The article was entitled, Students Celebrate National Coming Out Day. Here's how the article begins. In recognition of National Coming Out Day, Lipscomb University's LGBTQ+, plus, how about that? Why they add the plus? They've got so many now, they don't even know what to, they just call it plus in case something else comes up. Lipscomb University has an LGBTQ plus group. It says the students painted the bison rainbow colors. They stood around from early morning uh, until evening on Thursday in support of the LGBT uh, community on the campus. Throughout the day, donuts were handed out, faces were painted, conversations took place. I called a friend of mine who works at Lipscomb, and I said, is this true? Did this really happen? He said, absolutely, it happened. He was disgusted by it. Brethren, where am I going with this? My point is this. Christians, members of the Lord's Church, we've got to be talking about this. We've got to be teaching about this. We've got to be strongly and regularly teaching our young people how to answer the arguments that are being made about this. And so what I want to do this morning is this. I want to go through some arguments that I have heard made, now listen, by members of the church. Most of these are arguments that have been made by members of the church, and I've collected them, and we've got to deal with this. Because if we can't get this right, we don't get anything right. Number one, I have heard members of the church say this, well, homosexuals have a right to be married. They, they, we may not like it, but that's their right. Brethren, here's the problem with that. They're not married. They weren't married on June 27th of 2015, and they weren't married on June 28th after the Supreme Court passed their ruling. And this is why I say that. The Supreme Court doesn't have the right to make that decision. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 6 says this, What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, that tells us some very important things about marriage. It tells us, number one, God is the one who does the joining. And so if God does not join you, you are not really married. And the fact of the matter is, God will not join two people except in accordance with His law. God will not join two men together. God will not join two women together. And so the state gives them a piece of paper saying that they're married, but they're not really married. And so when a Christian says they have the right to be married, they are misunderstanding something very fundamental about marriage. Here's the next one. I have heard people say, members of the church say, well, all sins are the same. One sin is not worse than another sin. Brethren, I have heard that a lot since this happened. First, I'm not sure where this idea comes from. There is no verse in the Bible that says all sins are the same. I guess the reason we say it is we understand that any sin can cause you to be lost. And I guess that's where the idea comes from. Whether you could commit murder or tell a quote, little white lie, you can lose your soul. We'll lose your soul for that if you don't repent. From that, people have started saying all sins are the same. That is not a biblical principle, that all sins are the same. In fact, if I could show you a verse in the Bible that says the opposite of that, would that settle it for you? In fact, if I could show you Jesus himself saying the opposite of that, that ought to settle it, right? I want to begin here. John chapter 19 and verse 11, Jesus is standing before Pilate. And Jesus says to Pilate, You could have no power at all against me, except it has been given to you from above. Now listen to this part. Therefore, the one who has delivered me to you, he is guilty of the greater sin. Now, I want to stop and, and consider that phrase, greater sin. I want you to notice that Jesus says some sins are greater than other sins. We could stop right there, and that would be the end of this discussion. 
But let's go on. Secondly, consider this. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. The Bible says, But evil men and impostors grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Here's my question. If all sins are completely equal, how could you grow worse? Seems like you just have a level. There's nothing above it. There's nothing below it. But the, the Bible says you can get worse. How about this? Psalm chapter 19, the Bible discusses what is called, the King James says, secret and presumptuous sins. Now, the language there is a little bit confusing in the King James. A secret sin, we think secret means you know, no, nobody knows about it. That's not what the word there means. The word in the Hebrew carries with it the idea of a hidden sin. And specifically in that context, it means it's hidden to the individual. It means I committed a sin and I didn't know it was a sin. We would call it a sin of ignorance. And then it contrasts that with a presumptuous sin. A presumptuous sin means you knew good and well it was a sin, you did it anyway. Now, after talking about a sin of ignorance versus a sin of full knowledge, in Psalm 19, 13, he refers to the presumptuous sin as the great transgression. Now, what's that mean? If you commit a sin of ignorance, it's still a sin. But if you knew good and well it was a sin and you shake your fist in the face of God and say, I'm going to do it anyway, God doesn't view those two things the same. Both are sins but one is more serious. How about this? Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16, the Bible says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to Him. If all sins are the same, then friends, I don't even know what this passage means. Because what he is telling us is here is a list of sins that are particularly offensive. This is kind of a top ten, a top seven list of sins that are the most offensive to God. How about this? Exodus chapter 32 and verse 30. Moses is up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. Do you remember what's going on at the base of the mountain? At the base of the mountain, they are worshiping the golden calf. They are saying, you are our God who brought us out of Egypt, and they're dancing around it. And Moses comes down from the mountain. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 21, when he sees it, this is what he says to Aaron. Aaron, how have you brought so great a sin upon the people? That is, you've looked at an idol and called it God. He said, this is a high-level sin. This is serious. Aaron, not all sins are the same. How about this? 1 Samuel 2, 22 through 24 says that some sins are against man, some sins are against God. What's the point? Not all sins are the same. One is more serious than the other. 1 John 5, 16 says there's a sin unto death, there's a sin not unto death. It's not our point right now to talk about what that means except to observe not all sins are the same. 2 Peter 2 and verse 20 talks about one who obeys the gospel. And then he goes back into sin, and the Bible says the latter end is worse with him than the beginning. It would have been better for him not to have known the way of righteousness than after having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto him. Now, in the beginning you were lost, but then he says the latter end is worse. Friends, what's worse than being lost? If all sins are the same, how do you even get in a situation that's worse than being lost? Now, I could go on and on and on. There are literally hundreds of passages that teach not all sins are the same. Some sins are greater, some are lesser, some have greater consequences. Some have lesser consequences. Friends, I'm not trying to belittle this, but who would believe that God looks down from heaven and sees a man sexually molesting a child and sees another man running a red light and says, those are the same? Are those the same to you? They're not the same to me. And you know what? They're not the same to God. We've got to stop saying that. Here's number three. This is closely akin, but I saw a man who professes to be a gospel preacher write an article to this effect. He said, homosexuality is no worse than adultery or heterosexual fornication. His argument was fornication is fornication. Homosexual fornication, heterosexual fornication, it's all fornication. God sees it the same. And so he says, I don't know why my brethren are so upset about this gay marriage issue. Friends, I want to tell you, while heterosexual, heterosexual uh, fornication is a sin, don't get me wrong, we ought to be upset about that, but what I'm saying is they are not the same. God does not view them the same. I want you to notice this. This is Romans chapter 1 and verse 26. There's a discussion there of homosexuality. I want to read it, and then I'm going to make some observations about it. King James Version reads this way. For this cause God gave them up, homosexuals, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections. He says, for even their women 
did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men working with men that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the just recompense of their error which was meet. I want to pull out some key phrases from this. Number one, the Bible says God gave them up to vile affections. Homosexuality is described as vile affections. Let me read you the definition of the word vile. It means morally base or evil, wicked, depraved, and sinful, offensive to the senses and sensibilities, repulsive, disgusting, cheap, worthless, degrading, lowly, of poor quality, very inferior. In fact, this Greek phrase comes from a, uh, th this phrase that we have, passions of dishonor, comes from a Greek phrase, literally, the, the phrase means passions of dishonor. To have these feelings is dishonorable. It is a passion of dishonor. That's the first thing. Number two, he describes homosexuality as, the King James says, unseemly. In the second half of verse 27, men working with men that which is unseemly. What does unseemly mean? I looked up this Greek word to see what it means, and I looked in Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. It said, see shame, S-H-A-E-M-E. Don't you hate when you look up a word and tells you to look up another word? I don't know what the word means. So I looked it up in Persbacher's Greek lexicon, and it said, indecency, infamous lust, lewdness. Now here's the third one. This is particularly pertinent to our discussion. He says that men were doing that which is unnatural. I want to be tactful about the way I say this, but if you think about the anatomy of a man and you think about the anatomy of a woman, there is a natural design there. God made us that way. In contrast, when a man has sexual relations with another man or a woman has sexual relations with another woman, it is unnatural. It is vile. It is passions of dishonor. And so when people say it's the same, the Lord views it the same, while both are sin, He does not view them the same. Here's number four. I have heard people say, now you've got to put your seatbelt on for this one. I, have heard, I was sitting in a Bible class, and I heard a member of the church say this. I almost fell out of my chair. She said, well, the Bible doesn't actually condemn homosexuality. And I thought, what in the world? So what happens is this. You're talking to a friend, maybe about this gay marriage issue, and your friend says, so why are you opposed to it? You say, well, the Bible condemns it. And your friend says, where? You say, well, you know, Genesis 18 and 19, Sodom and Gomorrah, God destroyed them because of homosexuality. And your friend says, no, he didn't. You say, of course he did. They say, no, he didn't. And you say, what are you talking about? And your friend says, well, this is what the Bible says. You, we've always been told that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality, but this is what the Bible actually says. And this is what the woman did in Bible class. She read Ezekiel 16, 49. This is what it says. Look, this was the sin of Sodom. She and her daughter had pride and fullness of food and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. She said, see, we've always been told that God destroyed them because of homosexuality, but the Bible flat out says this was the sin of Sodom. Pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness, and she did not strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So what do you say to that? How do you, how do you answer that? In fact, if you're interested, several years ago, Brother Thomas Eves, who used to work with the East Tennessee School of Preaching, he did a written debate with a homosexual preacher. Now, that's weird to me. There are homosexual churches, but he did a written debate. And uh, I, I have the book, and I read, I've read it from cover to cover. I would read this homosexual's argument. He takes every verse in the Bible that mentions homosexuality and puts a spin on it. And I would read what he said about it, and I would think, man, alive, how do you answer that? Then I'd read Brother Eves and say, okay, okay, that's good. Well, the book is out of print, but at GBN we have it in digital form, PDF, if you want it, we will send it to you for free. All you've got to do is give me your email address, write your name, your email address, make it legible. Boy, I've gotten some chicken scratch email addresses, but if you will write it legibly and hand it to me, then we, I'll have the secretary email it to you. It won't cost you a dime. Brethren, you need, to, you need to know these arguments because we're being hit with this. When somebody hits you with this, you need to know how to answer it. 
So what's the answer to this? Does Ezekiel 16, 49 say this was the sin of Sodom? It does. Keep reading. Here's the next verse. Ezekiel 16, 50 says, and, what does that mean? There's more to the story. He says, and they were haughty, and they committed abomination. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. You know what that means? I learned something from this passage. You don't have a nation that is godly, and the next day they embrace homosexuality. That's not the way it works. There's a progression to this. And so, the people then were, at one point, good people, God-fearing people. And over time, they get to the point that they are prideful, and they're rich, and they, you know, they tolerate sin, and they don't care what's going on around them. They're only concerned about themselves. They don't help the poor. And then you get to the, the, the fact that they're okay with these things, and they eventually embrace homosexuality, and the Lord says, I've had enough. My question is, where are we as a country? Could you say that we've gotten to the point that we're rich? and we get to the point that we're full of ourselves, and we don't care about anybody but self. I'm not talking about Christians. I'm talking about the nation. Eventually, we get to the point that we embrace homosexuality. I don't know how we could say we haven't. It's the law of the land. And so, we find ourselves in this position. He says, finally, they committed abomination, and I took them away. Do you know what homosexuality is frequently referred to as in the Old Testament? It is called abomination. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13 says, If a man lies with a man as he would lie with a woman, they have both committed abomination, and they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon their own head. Now, the death penalty for homosexuality does not exist in the New Testament, but it did exist in the Old Testament. Let me go to the next point for the sake of time. How long do I have again? You said a quarter after or a quarter till? Ten minutes. Oh, man, I'm in trouble. Okay. Here's the next one, number five. I'll move through these quickly. Number five, I have heard people say this, well, God made them that way. We don't have a right to say anything because they were born that way. Friends, first, we can show biblically and scientifically that they were not born that way. Biblically, did you notice the passage that we just read a moment ago from uh, Romans chapter 1? Notice that it says, man gave up the natural use of the woman and burned in their lust one toward another. It doesn't say they were born that way. It says they gave it up. They made a choice to do that. That's an important distinction that we notice. Scientifically, there have been at least eight major studies that have been done around the world in which they studied people who were homosexuals, and particularly they studied twins because if a person is a twin and he's a homosexual, a homosexual and it's because he was born that way, in other words, it's his DNA, if he's a homosexual, then his brother should be a homosexual. You know why? Because twins have the same DNA. And so if one's a homosexual, the other should be a homosexual 100% of the time. When they did these studies with brothers, two boys, what they found is they were not homosexuals 100% of the time. What they found is it was only 11% of the time that if one was gay, the other would be gay. When they studied sisters, that is, if one's a lesbian, if it's DNA, it should be 100%. What they found was 14% of the time. The studies showed it is not because you were born that way. What does that mean? Science doesn't support it. The Bible doesn't support it. So why is it that most people, most Americans now believe that you were born that way? Why is that? It's because media has shoved it down our throats for so long. We believe it, not because of science, not because of the Bible. Here's the next one. People have said, well, if homosexuality is wrong, how come Jesus never said that it was wrong? Jesus never said the word homosexuality, but this is what he said. Matthew 19, have you not read that he that made them in the beginning made them male and female? Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Jesus defined marriage as a male and a female. Now, you could put this in a logical syllogism and point out any sex outside of marriage is sinful. Sex inside of marriage must be a male and a female, and you can prove that Jesus condemned homosexuality. Number eight, for the sake of time, I've heard people say homosexuals getting married is a civil right. It is equal to racial equality. They'll say back in the 60s and 70s, there was a fight in this country for blacks to have equal rights to whites. 
This is the modern day version of that. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to be kind, but that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. The reason I say that is a person's race is not an activity they choose to engage in. A person's race is not a sin. A person's race is not even a choice. A person's race, nationality, skin color is not a matter of right and wrong. In fact, Acts 17 and verse 26 says, God has made of one blood every nation that dwells on the face of the earth. You know what that means? The Lord is saying we all come from the same parents of one blood. That's why racism is stupid. Because we all are descendants of Adam and Eve. And 1 Samuel 17 and verse uh, 6 says that God looketh not on the outward appearance as man does, but God looks on the heart. He says man gets caught up in the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. But you see, homosexuality is a violation of God's word. It is people choosing to do something that God forbids. They are not equivalent to each other. Here's the next one. People have said, well, they're not hurting you, so why don't you mind your own business? Very quickly, one verse. Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. If you study sexual crimes against children, percentage speaking, speaking from a percentage standpoint, sexual crimes against children committed by homosexuals far out, uh, exceeds those by heterosexuals. Don't believe it's not hurting anybody. Here's the last point, very quickly, for the sake of time. What is our responsibility in this matter? Brethren, number one, we cannot compromise. We could sit back and say, if we buck this, we're going to be persecuted. If we speak out, we're going to be ridiculed. There was one church I wanted to speak about some things like this, and one of the elders told me, you can't talk about that here because we might lose our tax-exempt status. Are you kidding me? Who cares if we lose our tax-exempt status? I still have time. Okay. Revelation chapter 2 says this. We oftentimes quote this in the plan of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and then live faithfully. Revelation 2.10 is what we say. Did you know that's not what Revelation 2.10 is talking about? Revelation 2 and verse 10 says, Fear none of the things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. You shall be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days. But be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. I want you to notice, he doesn't say be faithful until death. He says be faithful unto death. He says some of you are going to be persecuted. Some of you are going to get thrown into prison. Some of you are going to die for your Christianity. But be faithful, even if you lose your tax-exempt status. We can't compromise. Number two, very quickly, we need to reach out to homosexuals with the gospel. Friends, the church is not a country club for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And we need to teach and understand that homosexuals are sinners who need to hear the gospel. It could be that we find homosexuality repugnant to the point that we would not even invite them to services. If that is the case, then shame on you and shame on me if we so class homosexuality as a sin that we think they're not good enough for the truth. You know what? You weren't good enough for the truth, and neither was I. But thank God that somebody took the time to teach us. Number three... We need to teach and we need to understand that homosexuals can change. Just as homosexuality is a learned behavior, they can learn better behavior. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, there is a list of those who will not go to heaven. Listen to this. Do you not know the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. He says... These will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Those who practice homosexuality, it says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then when you get to verse 11, two verses later, he says, And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord our God and by the Spirit of, of our God. What's he saying? Some of the members of the Corinth Church of Christ used to be homosexuals. But he said they repented and they stopped it, and they obeyed the gospel, and they were forgiven. Brethren, if I were going to summarize this lesson in three points, I would say very quickly, number one, we serve a judge who is infinitely greater than the Supreme Court of the United States. Number two, our resolve as Christians must be infinitely greater than the world around us. 
and their resolve is strong. Number three, the blood of Jesus Christ is infinitely greater than any sin that we can commit, and that includes homosexuality. Sorry I had to rush through that. Thank you for your good attention. I appreciate it so much.